Who are the people we need to kick out of society? Let's find out, starting with... Number five, Kasher Kwan. Rapper Kasher Kwan scammed a surgeon 200 times and bragged about pushing the man to the brink of ending his own life. The Detroit rapper appeared on an episode of the Say Cheese podcast where he talked about how he ruined this guy's life for no apparent reason. For his scam, Kwan had somehow got his hands on the surgeon's social security number. Then, every time the guy would get paid, Kwan would call him up and pretend to be an IRS agent, then demand money. Sometimes the surgeon would respond that he was in the middle of surgery, but Kwan didn't care. He forced the doctor to get the money immediately or threatened that the IRS would be after him in a bad way. Kwan explained that the man was making $2,500 a week and that he had the surgeon wrapped around his little finger. The scam ended up ruining the medical professional's life. His marriage broke down and he fell into a dark place psychologically. Kwan was stealing all of the doctor's money, leaving the poor man feeling so helpless that he couldn't take it anymore. So the surgeon attempted to end it all and sent Kwan a picture of himself in the hospital. Kwan, whose discography ironically contains albums titled Scam Jesus and Scam Likely, broke down every part of his two years of deception, rightfully infuriating listeners. People called him out for doing something so messed up and acting proud of it. The clip went viral, with even his own fans being disgusted with him for acting like what he did was some kind of achievement. He posted on Instagram whining about the backlash he received, claiming that everything he did to the doctor happened a decade ago when he was 15 years old. Sure, we've all done stuff we're not proud of when we were teenagers, but to drive that man to the brink of ending it all, there's really no excuse for something like that. Quan went as far as to say that he dealt with bad karma for his actions and clarified that he had said in the interview he regretted it, so people should leave him alone. What's even dumber is that there was no reason for him to talk about it on the podcast. He just wanted something to brag about. What do you think about this guy? Do you even believe that a 15-year-old managed to scam a doctor for two years and take all his money? No one has been able to get the identity of the supposed doctor he was scamming. Or do you think he was just going for some street cred and his boasts were all fiction? Let us know in the comments. Number four, Starbucks. Former Starbucks employee Michael Harris lost his job after stopping a robbery at the mega coffee retailer St. Louis, Missouri location. Okay, we know we're not talking about a person here, but we can still vote Starbucks off the island. In December of 2023, two armed men went into the store where Harris worked and robbed several customers. Although the store's handbook recommends employees not to engage if a robbery occurs at their location, which is always the correct plan of action, but Harris apparently didn't read the handbook. The two men demanded cash from the register, but Harris wasn't senior enough to be able to open it. He still tried anyway, but it was taking too long. So one of the robbers grew impatient and tried to hit him with a firearm. Then a piece of the weapon broke off and Harris and his co-workers realized the weapon was a fake. So in this particular scenario, Harris did what pretty much anyone would do in the situation. Without any other way to defend themselves, Harris and his co-worker, Devin Jones Ransom, fought the intruders. One of the men ran away when the fight broke out, but Harris and Ransom caught the other one and restrained him while they waited for police to arrive. Weeks after the incident, a Starbucks higher up called Harris to tell him they were letting him go. Harris sought legal representation from the Krupp Law Firm LLC for wrongful termination. Although Starbucks handbook states that employees shouldn't do anything to escalate a situation, Harris was in an impossible situation. He complied with the robber's demands until he, his co-worker, and customers were in danger. At that point, he did what he could do to defend himself and those around him. Starbucks released a statement to Fox Business where it reiterated that safety is a top priority and that its training teaches employees to comply and de-escalate to keep everyone safe. And that's the right policy. Your life and physical safety should never be put at risk for a company that doesn't care about you. However, what was Harris supposed to do when the men attacked him? Starbucks is in pretty hot water over this, as they should be. So what do you think? Should we boycott the company and get our caffeinated milkshakes elsewhere? Anyone like coffee, bean, and tea leaf? Number three, out of society. 
TikTok banned a viral prankster who did dangerous stuff like starting trouble with McDonald's staff, riding a fire truck's roof, and throwing broomsticks off the top of a skyscraper. The TikToker, whose username is out of society, gained tens of thousands of followers and millions of likes with his dumb antics. One of his more obnoxious posts involved McDonald's staff. Out of society went to a location and snatched a broom from an employee. He then rushed into the kitchen and placed the brush in the deep app fryer potentially ruining a ton of McDonald's fries, which is a crime on its own. A worker managed to get it out, so the prankster got it again and threw the broom across the dining room and sprinted out of the fast food restaurant, shoving staff out of his way as he left. The TikToker wore a balaclava and changed his voice to conceal his identity because he's just so slick. In another video, Out of Society documented himself standing on top of a skyscraper and launching two brooms over the edge, causing them to drop to the ground from hundreds of feet in the air. The account also posted a clip from the top of a fire truck and riding on its roof. Three young men were involved in the incident, and when firefighters tried to get them to jump down, they refused, telling workers to shut up. Police arrested the three guys over the incident. However, it didn't slow down the popularity of Out of Society. Since December of 2022, it received 10 million views and 1.6 million likes. While some users loved Out of Society's content, his actions didn't impress everyone. Many slammed the social media platform for letting someone like Out of Society get famous by scaring and harassing people trying to do their jobs. In 2022, TikTok carried out an initiative to remove content that violated community guidelines before anyone needed to report it. As a result, the platform removed 96% of content violating its guidelines, which is a step in the right direction. Although TikTok didn't catch Out of Society's content until people reported the user, it removed the account as it depicted dangerous acts that could have caused significant harm to the people involved. So TikTok did the right thing. But with this kind of content being so popular, they still need to remove many more accounts. And like, look, we're good with pranks, even when they're upsetting and annoying. But there's a difference between a prank and just being an annoying jerk. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out the craziest tactics these ladies will do to smuggle out a watch. Number two, Eric Kellogg. Eric Kellogg, the former mayor of Harvey, Illinois, accepted bribes to turn a blind eye to an adult activities ring operating in a local exotic dancing location. YouTube hears all the words we say, so hopefully you get what we're talking about. Kellogg and several of his family members had been on federal investigators' radars since the filing of a federal complaint back in 2019. Apparently, Kellogg took bribes from a club owner in exchange for allowing money to be exchanged for adult services in the club. Arnie's Idle Hour. Kellogg had demanded $3,000 monthly from the club in order for it to be allowed to operate. Those payments continued for five years until Kellogg increased the rate to $6,000 a month. The club initially refused to pay the new fee, so a Harvey police officer ordered them to cease operations. The mayor's brother, Rommel Kellogg, allegedly worked with their cousin, Corey Johnson, to carry out the scheme. The pair demanded and collected the payments from the club, threatening that the city could disrupt the club's operations if it was late on payments. Corey Johnson accepted at least $500,000 in bribes from the club over a period of about 14 years. Law enforcement eventually searched the club's premises on suspicion of running a brothel and tax crimes and struck up a deal with the club's manager. Authorities ordered the manager to stop offering illegal services out of the business but keep paying Kellogg. Over the next few months, the club made payments of 37000 bucks. Although authorities haven't officially charged Kellogg yet, his brother Rommel was found guilty of five counts of conspiracy and theft by intimidation. Police also arrested Johnson, who collected and delivered the bribes to Kellogg. Since he pleaded guilty for his role in the operation, prosecutors are seeking a prison sentence of six months or less. It may seem pretty crazy that a mayor would be acting like this outside of a TV show or something, but Kellogg's antics are pretty tame compared to what Kwame Kilpatrick, Detroit's former mayor, got up to. For a deeper dive into possibly the most corrupt official ever, check out this link for a deeper dive. Number one, Cambria Gabrielle Darby. Cambria Gabrielle Darby compared herself to Jesus after police arrested her for taking her son shopping in a diaper while he violently shivered. This Mississippi mother took her two-year-old boy on a shopping trip at her local Walmart in January of 2024. A winter storm had swept through the area and temperatures were below 20 degrees, but the child wasn't wearing socks, shoes, or even a jacket. So, of course, other shoppers and employees were flipping out, watching as the toddler 
shivered in the freezing cold. One shopper actually bought him a long sleeve shirt and pants, and he still shook after putting them on. So thankfully, someone called 911 since this is a pretty clearly terrible decision, and police arrived at the scene. Officers took the boy to sit in a warm car while they waited for paramedics to reach the location. Once medical workers arrived, the police turned their attention to Darby and arrested her. Child Protective Services took the child along with his two siblings. Police took Darby into custody, and after posting bail, she compared her situation to the suffering of Jesus. In a delusional 656-word Facebook post, Darby defended her actions and posted over 50 pictures to prove she was a good mother. The images included a trip to Disney World, her children posing with presents under a Christmas tree, and the family sitting on pumpkins at a farm. Her list of things that she felt proved she was a good mother included taking them on vacations, buying them expensive clothing, and signing them up for sports. She also listed things like taking them to Disney World for a VIP-style experience, going on plane rides, visiting indoor water parks, and elaborate holiday celebrations. Holidays were supposedly so magical for her children that they believed in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and Cupid. Bizarrely, she added that her children never wore the same outfit twice and that she frequently bought them designer clothing and new shoes. So why was her son only wearing a diaper if that was the case? Darby added that she had pictures of every meal she had ever cooked for her children and that she hadn't been able to eat since CPS took them away from her. She revealed that people had called law enforcement on her twice before, but fought the notion that she was a neglectful or mentally ill parent, referring to the accusations as defamation. A viral video showed Darby fighting with the shoppers who confronted her while she refused to give her son anything to wear. One woman draped a jacket over the toddler as his teeth chattered. A man yelled at her while she grabbed items off the shelves and threw them into the cart, narrowly missing the child. People pointed out that she forced her son to shop almost without any clothes on while she was fully clothed. Remember, this woman thought her plight was as bad as Jesus's, so she was never going to be remorseful about the situation. A Walmart employee, Felicia Nicole, lost her job over the incident when she posted a video of the boy online. If convicted, Darby faces up to six years in prison. It's totally delusional for Darby to claim she's a good mom. We don't care how many happy pictures she posts. If she's sending a two-year-old in 20-degree weather, wearing only a diaper, pants, and a shirt. For those of you who don't have kids, you may not know, but kids that age have very little body fat, so staying warm can be an issue for some of them, and bundling them up when it's cold is extremely important. And it's not like she didn't know, because that's not her first kid. So now, she wants to compare herself to Jesus. Well, judging from the response online, this is the only time she's right in the sense that she's getting a ton of backlash. What are some of the most daring robberies? Let's get right to it and start with... Number five, watch this. Two Las Vegas women, Nikki Grandel and Stacy Johnson, targeted and robbed a man they met on the Caesars Palace Casino floor. Grandel and Johnson were socializing with their victim when they convinced him to take them to his hotel room at Caesars Palace. But it wasn't long after they entered the room before he realized he was missing $6,500 and a Rolex watch. The man kept his valuable belongings in a small bag, and after discovering it was empty, he confronted the women. Grandel and Johnson did what anyone would do when wrongfully accused, fled the room and ran into the stairwell. But the women couldn't move faster than the Las Vegas police. The victim immediately reported the theft, and officers tracked down Grandel and Johnson using the hotel's surveillance footage and the victim's description. Police arrested the pair moments later and charged them with grand larceny. Authorities had to conduct an extensive search to find the Rolex, resorting to an x-ray examination where they discovered Grandel had placed a luxury watch inside her body to conceal it. And by body, you probably know what we mean. The one only women have. Additionally, Johnson stuffed the cash inside her pants. Grandel and Johnson's actions might seem extreme, but they were far from the only people to conduct this type of criminal operation at a casino. Cassidy Rain Paris was at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, when she approached a man at the casino's elevators. After telling the man he seemed tired and stressed, she offered to go up to his room to give him a massage. The man accepted the offer, and the pair went to his room. 
During the massage, Paris ordered him to remove his clothing and kissed him. She suddenly developed chest pain and excused herself to go to the bathroom. Within minutes, the victim heard his room door close and discovered his belongings were missing. Paris stole a Patek Philippe watch worth $50,000, 10,000 bucks in cash, and $6,100 in poker chips. Paris's scheme was well thought out. After luring the man to his room, she used a diversionary tactic to distract him so she could rob him. Except she underestimated how easy it would be to track her down. Similarly to Grandel and Johnson, surveillance video captured Paris sprinting down the hall and driving away in a red car. Police located the GPS tracker on the red car she used to flee the scene. They apprehended Paris four miles east of the casino at a Days Inn motel and charged her with a second degree felony for theft. So wait, we can't just trust any random women we meet named Nikki, Stacy, or Cassidy? Number four, Gourley's Five. A gang of five robbers carried out a jewelry heist at Danielle Jewelers in Birmingham, England. The gang stole a highways maintenance truck and smashed it into the storefront, narrowly missing a staff member. Three of the four robbers pulled a smash and grab. They barged into the store and smashed glass display cabinets with sledgehammers, then grabbed the jewelry and stuffed it into their sports bags. The fourth gang member stayed in one of the group's three vehicles, but the fifth kept the crowd at bay, waving an axe. The gang used a black Land Rover Discovery, a white Toyota Hilux, and a black Toyota Corolla for the raid. They parked the Land Rover and Toyota Corolla to block both sides of the ride of the jewelers and reversed the Hilux into the store. The five men fled the scene in the Land Rover and Hilux, abandoning the Corolla at the scene. Surveillance footage caught the group leaving the vehicles nearby and climbing into a stolen Audi TTS and a BMW 420. Despite spending weeks planning their operation, security cameras captured the entire robbery and many concerned onlookers watched it occur. The ringleader, John Gourley, attempted to sell a stolen bangle for $1,850 at Birmingham's Jewelry Quarter two hours after the raid, three miles from the jewelry store. Unfortunately for him, surveillance footage captured the entire interaction. Detectives used surveillance footage from nearby businesses and a witness's cell phone footage. They linked Gourley to the robbery by his fingerprints on the store's sale sheet. Another member, Hassan Zulikar, bought tape and pads at a nearby auto parts store, which he used to put false number plates on their getaway cars. Authorities discovered he stole the Land Rover after they recovered backings to the pads that Zulikar left inside the vehicle, which were covered in his fingerprints. Additionally, they tied the rest of the group to the theft through fingerprints, clothing, and tags from the stolen jewelry they found in one of the members' homes. Officers arrested all five members of the group and charged them with conspiracy to rob and possess an offensive firearm. Birmingham Crown Court conducted a four-week trial and found the group guilty. Their sentences range from 16 years to 12, reaching a combined total of 72 years. See? This is what happens when you get pulled in for one last big score. It never works. Number 3. King Crab David Sabeel is accused of conning seafood distributors out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Allegedly, Sabeel pretended to work at a grocery store and created fake email accounts to make it seem like they belonged to multiple Safeway grocery store employees. He used the accounts to deceive Arctic Foods, a San Francisco seafood distributor, out of $700,000. Sabeel used a false name and fake trucking company to plan two pickups and had rental documents that tied him to the trucks. After collecting the second shipment of crab, the owner of Arctic Foods reached out to Sabeel to discuss being overcharged. When the owner couldn't reach Sabeel, they contacted Safeway, who revealed Sabeel was not employed by them. The distributor owner informed authorities of Sabeel's actions, who began to watch him. Sabeel planned another shipment, but employees loaded cheaper seafood rather than king or snow crab into the truck. Police pulled over the truck driver and arrested him on counts of forgery and possession of a fraudulent bill. They found crab from Arctic Foods that matched one of Sabeel's alleged shipments being sold below market value in Florida. When Sabeel coordinated a fourth shipment from Arctic Foods, authorities placed position tracking devices on the packaging. The shellfish ended up at a junk removal service in Florida, with Sabeel likely unloading the product when he realized it wasn't King Crab. Sabeel booked a one-way ticket to Columbia, but Miami police arrested him before he could board the plane. 
Sabeel faces charges of bank fraud, grand theft, and counts of forgery and possession of a fraudulent bill. But this wasn't the first time Sabeel committed criminal activity in the seafood industry. Sabeel posed as a seafood buyer in Florida and Alabama, where he would contact suppliers and claim he was buying large quantities of shrimp, fish, and lobster for a cruise line. Sabeel arranged to receive the seafood at cold storage facilities in Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Volusia counties, where he paid for the shipments with counterfeit checks. He also didn't pay a line of credit extended to him on at least one occasion. Law enforcement caught Sabeel attempting to buy $60,000 of shrimp from a seafood wholesaler. He was allegedly responsible for $200,000 in losses to seafood businesses in Florida and Alabama, and for this scheme, charged with bank fraud and grand theft. Number two, Romanian skimming. The Riviera Maya gang specialized in skimming ATMs and stealing from tourists in Playa del Carmen and other nearby tourist areas in Mexico. The gang used skimming devices to obtain their victims' credit card information and copied their details onto blank cards to withdraw cash from ATMs worldwide. They likely began operating in 2012 and have targeted thousands of tourists. Florian Tudor is the leader of the Riviera Maya gang, which has around 1,000 members. He's a business businessman from Craiova, Romania, known as El Tiburon, or the Shark, among other gang members. Romanian authorities believe Tudor ordered fellow gang members to threaten, blackmail, beat up, and even bump off the gang's enemies, including former members who fell out with them. ATM skimming involves stealing credit card information by placing a skimming device on the machine that reads the card's magnetic stripe when inserted. Criminals use the information to create cloned credit and debit cards, which they then use to withdraw money and make purchases. The Riviera Mine gang took ATM skimming up a level, buying ATMs from well-known manufacturers, hacking their processors, and installing custom-designed software to steal bank card data. Their operation was far more sophisticated than the average criminals. They waited months before withdrawing money from compromised cards and almost always used them in ATMs far from where they were stolen or where the victims lived. The gang skimmers and poles operated worldwide, from India to Barbados to South Korea to Brazil and everywhere in between, making it almost impossible for victims to connect the theft to their Mexican vacation. Tudor and his stepbrother, Adrian Anicescu, set up Top Life Servicio Company in Cancun. It gave the gang the appearance of legitimacy while covering their criminal activities. Quickly, the gang decided it would skim more effectively if it had its own ATMs. So they went out and purchased some forum well-known manufacturers like Triton and Hyosung. They hacked their ATMs processors and installed custom-designed software to capture card data. Additionally, the gang had an agreement with Maltiva, a respected Mexican bank, to brand their ATMs with the bank's logo. Top Life operated over 100 Maltiva branded ATMs across the Riviera Maya and other popular tourist locations in Mexico by 2017. Wealthy tourists use those machines daily, innocently sticking their credit or debit cards for their information to be stolen. Each machine copied roughly 1,000 cards monthly from which the gang would withdraw $200. Combining all the machines they operated, the gang's monthly income was $20 million. Top Life invested the money in Mexican real estate state, such as the construction of their headquarters, a multi-story villa with a rooftop swimming pool, and an elevator built on land in the prime area of Cancun. Under Tudor's leadership, the gang laundered the funds. Most of Tudor's aides were Romanian and would withdraw small sums from stolen cards in Mexico, then send the money to Romania in cash or through Western Union. Tudor's relatives and business partners would invest the profits in luxury real estate that they legally sold to cover up any criminal activity. Despite running a sophisticated and carefully planned operation, Journalist Brian Krebs received a tip from a technician that worked for a Mexican ATM company that a gang was offering $6,000 to install Bluetooth skimming devices in ATMs. Krebs traveled to Mexico to further investigate the potential criminal activity and discovered many ATMs had a Bluetooth link called Free to Move. His trip prompted Krebs to write a three-part story on his blog about ATM skimming where he mentioned an Eastern European gang behind the scam. Tudor was furious and ordered members to temporarily extract chips from from 10 ATMs they owned and 25 to 30 ATMs belonging to other companies or banks. Mexican police never followed up on the revelations in Krebs' articles, but the gang temporarily shut down their operations anyway. Although the gang avoided criminal charges, Tudor was beginning to unravel. His relationship with one of his most trusted men, Constantine Sorinal Marcu, deteriorated. Tudor was envious of Marcu's relationships with women, and Marcu wanted a high
higher cut than he was getting from the business. After a heated exchange over WhatsApp in May 2015, Tudor instructed all gang members to cut ties with Marku. In April 2018, three gang members attacked Marku. Two months later, Marku passed away. Not only did his passing unleash a war with Marku's family and allies, but it put the Riviera Maya gang on law enforcement's radar. In May 2021, Mexican authorities arrested Tudor following years of investigations by Mexican and Romanian authorities. His arrest was in response to an extradition request from Romania, where he could face charges of organized crime, extortion, and attempted murder. Number 1. Partners in Crime Husband and wife duo Emmanuel and Kara Williams committed bank robberies in Florida and Alabama between December 2012 and November 2013. The couple made little effort to cover their tracks, using similar methods in each robbery. Emmanuel would enter the bank wearing an afro wig or a hat and pass a note with block lettering to the bank teller, demanding money. The pair robbed 15 banks within a short time, with seven of those robberies occurring between December 2012 and February 2013. Six more robberies happened between August and October 2013, and at least two being only a few days apart. The amount they took ranged from $1,623 to $8,438 per bank, and their net total was $54,750. Onlookers and surveillance cameras caught the couple driving away in high-end sports utility vehicles. In an August 28th robbery, a nearby business's security camera captured Emmanuel getting into a black 2011 Mercedes-Benz GLK350. Another camera filmed them using a white Mustang in an August 22nd robbery. Using flashy cars and crimes? Wonder if that'll blow back on them. The FBI linked both vehicles to Kara Williams. After requesting video from the Florida Department of Transportation Turnpike Authority to track the license plate number of the Mercedes to her, FBI agents conducted physical surveillance of the couple's Tampa apartment where they had a front row seat into the duo's operation. There was a breakthrough in the case after the couple targeted a mid-Florida credit union, after which FBI agents tracked Emmanuel's cell phone activity to link his location to cell towers during the dates and times of the couple's crimes. They also used his social media photos to identify a scar on Emmanuel's left thumb, which he covered with a cloth on his hand to hide from the cameras and bank surveillance videos. Ten days after their first bank robbery, Kara gave birth around December 15th, 2012. At the time, Kara was on maternity leave from her job at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Kara also took sick days corresponding to bank robberies in Tampa and Auburndale. The FBI's investigation into the couple uncovered the couple's criminal activities, resulting in the pair's arrest. Kara and Emmanuel were charged with conspiracy to obstruct, delay, or affect commerce by robbery, each carrying a potential maximum 20-year prison sentence. Jeez, Kara, if you hated your job so much, you could have just quit. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have, free Chick-fil-A for life or free Chipotle for life.